Hey everybody, this is Chad Geis with Surgeon, and today we are so privileged to be able to sit down and visit with Thomas Morstead, uh, somebody that I got to know, and just a tremendous individual, great deal of character. And as we want to, we, what we want to do is talk about this message of Surgeon, this identity. Um, we want to encourage you to go to SurgeonRevelation.com. Uh, we're the ones sponsoring this video today, but the intent of this is to make a difference in people's lives through a message, through an identity through these characteristics that I think that we all set back um, and we understand are something to be respected and admired, but we want to look at them in a little different light than maybe you've thought of in the past. Uh, Thomas is a notable football player for the New Orleans Saints, and just in my time that I've been exposed to him, been able to be around him, uh, he certainly expresses these characteristics of a surgeon, which as we stop and consider what a surgeon does, it's a person who makes a difference in other people's lives through their gifts, their talents, their hard work, their dedication. Um, they truly change other people's lives through that. And so we're going to talk about that today with surgeon. We're going to talk with Thomas. We're going to talk about how he's a surgeon and these characteristics that I've come to see expressed in him um, as he is a football player, but does so many things beyond that off of the field. So Thomas, we we thank you for your time today. It's great to have you with us. Um, let's kind of jump right into this thing. You know, we we met maybe in an unlikely way because I'm not a you know I'm not a big football follower. Right. I grew up in a small town, didn't even have football and go pokes. But you know, I, I want to mention some people: uh, Philip Elliott that works for me, and Laura Daniels that works for your foundation. Actually, put us together in terms of an introduction, kind of seeing some things. Laura came across our website and saw kind of the idea that was presented, this identity that was presented uh, through it. And so this is a, such an expression of who Thomas was. So she reached out and Philip said, hey, you know, I know you don't follow football much, Chad, but you need to kind of take a look at this thing. I think there might be something here. And so they put us together about a, you know, what, a year, year and a half ago, yep, something like that. Ago, yep. And uh, through that time, we've just kind of, I've kind of gotten to know you a little bit. And we just want to talk about your story. You know, this is, I want to have people get to know you the way I've gotten to know you. Uh, this identity of surgeon, we want to kind of unpack it a little bit today and kind of explore how uh, it really is truly just a decision to make a difference in people's lives. And, it, and it's a reach beyond occupation. It's impact beyond occupation. And you don't necessarily think as in terms of a football player, maybe changing people's lives through what they do, but that's where we want to go to today. We want to kind of talk about your impact, some of the things you do beyond uh, your on the field activities to your off the field activities. So let's just jump right into it. Let's let's kind of go back to the beginning. Let's talk about maybe where you grew up, where you came from what you know what's brought you to where you are today so let's just kind of roll the reel back and let's say where's thomas morstead from what's thomas okay. morstead all about um, let's go to the story pearland texas which is a suburb of uh houston um you know i guess my story is like everybody's story it's got lots of different twists and turns um you know i was not the most likely nfl athlete i was probably the least likely nfl athlete entering high school and um you know, really focused hard on my academics, and that was going to be my way to kind of make something of my life. And, uh, you know, I was able to get an engineering scholarship because of my studies in school and um, had the opportunity to try out for my uh, college team where I went to SMU in Dallas. And, um, you know, I was a late bloomer for sure. And, um, I had to come back and try out again the second year mm -hmm. and um you know everything started clicking right around 20 years old and my focus definitely turned towards football more then and by the end of that five-year period i was drafted by the saints and i've been in new orleans for a decade now and uh that's the outline, I guess, of, well, of, okay, me, well, you know, of the you, start. You, you threw something out there, you know, and this is where the, the story has to come in. You know, you said you're most least likely to maybe be an NFL football player, and that's always intriguing. There's, there's got to be a story behind it because, you know, I look at you and, you know, you're like sitting down having an interview with Thor, you know, the guy's six foot 
three and 225 pounds. Yeah. His, he has a foot that kicks a ball into the clouds instead of a hammer. So, you know, you got to give us the backstory. Why are you the least well, likely? I was always into athletics as a kid. Um, I always felt like I was, um, you know, gifted at a young age, but, but, uh, and I, and I loved competing and I loved sport and I loved running and racing. And, um, but I never, you know, a, as everybody kind of goes through adolescence at a different uh, time in their life. And, um, I was on the extreme back end late of that. And, uh, mm -hmm. so when I went into high school, I was about the smallest boy in the high school to start ninth grade, which is challenging when there's 4,000 kids in a school and you're trying to be in athletics. Um, so, uh, you know, I broke my leg first scrimmage of high school football in August of 2000 and, um, just really, uh, didn't feel like it was in the cards for me to, you know, I, I wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was being protected at the time. Um, and I was just this small kind of terrified kid. Um, now you say small, cause I'm sitting in here looking at a person before me that's not small. I mean, you're my brother's size. He got yeah. all the groceries growing up, you know, so kind of put a framework around that for our listeners. Well, I just remember being five foot, 90 pounds, first day of high school. And I'll have to, I'll have to get you a picture to prove it because no one believes it. Five um, foot, 90 pounds. Yeah. My 13 year old daughter is actually taller yeah. and weighs more than that. So, yeah. So it was, you know, kind of a very unique, you know, that I was, that I still hadn't grown at all at that point. Right. And, um, and so, you know, I, I love football. I love soccer. A um, bunch of other sports that I played, but, um, you know, it's just tough to compete in a big high school like that right. with, um, you know, so many gifted athletes. And um, so it just didn't feel like it was in the cards for me. And I really, you know, I studied really hard. Um, I would say I was uh, one, uh, I think a good thing that I had going for me is that I was, you know, open to being challenged all the time. I wasn't trying to take the easy classes to right. just get through high school I was you know I was there was something about it that I wanted to be challenged and so I really did that all through high school and it, it's you know it's paid dividends for sure so I mean I guess it's what it sounds like really as you're talking about it always came down to a function of choice it wasn't necessarily you know your desire to play football or you know you weren't necessarily just scholastically automatically a genius I mean you always made that choice to push yeah. To, you but know, I'm not better. sure why I did that and why other people don't. So I don't, I didn't, or I don't, I don't know. I didn't know that at the time, I guess is, you know, it's just part of kind of some people are driven. Some people have different qualities about them. And for right. whatever reason, I just wasn't, um, afraid of failing, I guess. Um, and I wasn't afraid to, uh, I wasn't looking for the easiest route. That wasn't in my mindset, I guess. And so i um, very fortunate for sure that that's kind of the way I thought about things at the time. Right. So, you know, I guess coming out of high school, you weren't thinking going to the pros. You weren't thinking professional athlete. You were, you were scholastically based and scholastic. Yep. I mean, you left football, but yep. to tell the future and think I'm going to be playing for, you know, NFL team. Right. I didn't even have college aspirations, even my senior year when I went out for football, it was just to have a great experience. My mom convinced me to, to uh, just go out and uh, give it a shot, just to be a great experience for my senior year of high school. And um, our town kind of shuts down on Friday nights. And so um, I went and talked to our head coach, uh, you know, I think two days before school started to see if it was you know, if, if they would have me and, mm -hmm. and he was glad to have me. He, they already had a, um, a kicker punter that was the guy that was starting, Right. but they would love to have me as a part of the team. And so, um, I just, you know, I tried my best to get better every day. And as the season went along, I kind of took over different jobs, uh, whether it was punting or kicking and, um, you know, and when the season ended, I thought that was it. You know, I didn't, I didn't have a thought of planning college at that point. And then, uh, you know, if you, oh, the week after we finished our season, there were some uh, college coaches there that I got pulled out of classes three times in one day. I remember to talk to different college coaches about playing college football. And that was the first time I had even, that was even an idea that I could try to do. 
Um, so, yeah. You know, as you look at that and you look at how things kind of progress in life, you know, this, again, this foundational expression of a surgeon, because, you know, we, we as a society, and I'm going to back up a little bit, this identity of surgeon, I think it's something that we can all kind of wrap our heads around in terms of respect or somebody to look up to, because we inherently know what it takes to become a surgeon. You know, it takes years of dedication, skill, hard work, um, some intellect, and we know, you know, the outcome of that should be to make a difference in people's lives. And so as we kind of talk around some of the things that you're doing off the field that make a difference, you know, I think it's important maybe to stop and think about some of these people that are making a difference in your life because there was something and someone that put you on this path that had to give you that encouragement oh. along the way. You know, some people make it through without that, and it's a tremendous triumph. But as we, we got to visit a little bit and got to know each other, it sounds like you were surrounded by a lot of people that were an encouragement to you. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, either growing up, your parents, maybe uh, people, whether it was coaches that encouraged you through high school, through college yeah. career, and even beyond that, you know, some people that have made you and influenced you to be who you are, because you're a remarkable individual. The more I've gotten to know you and, and speak with you, we want to maybe kind of hear about some of these influences, people that were... Yeah. You know, these surgeons to you that changed your life, that made your life better as a result of their actions and their, you know, influence. Yeah, I would say, number one, my parents, um, you know, they've just been models of um, consistency. And, um, you know, I think everybody's normal is different because they grew up in different circumstances, different environment. And I had about as stable an environment as you can have growing up. So I think that's huge. Um, I had differing perspectives. You know, I had family. My mom is from England, and so we used to go, you know, some people had never been out of our town right. growing up, and I didn't understand what the big deal was. How, how can't you get out of the town? You can drive over there and, you know, right. go see a different place. And, uh, but I felt like that because, you know, we would go to England every year and a half growing up, and, and I would get to um, do all sorts of, um, you know, travel across the world, mm -hmm. and that kind of opened your mind up to some... Uh, some different things that are out there. Um, and I've just had wonderful uh, mentors and coaches all along the way. Um, I had a great uh, soccer coach, uh, George Dominguez, from six years old to 18 years old. Me and his boy were the same age. And so I had that for 12 years. And, and that was on a primarily Spanish speaking uh, team where uh, I was kind of in the minority. And right. that was unique to you know, get a different perspective of a lot of those different kids' lives and, and the differences between mine and theirs. Um, I had a, my first football coach, Trace Craft, was, uh, uh, he, he really stoked the fire of, of, and love of kicking. He was a college kicker. Right. And so we worked on a lot of special team stuff at seventh grade level, which doesn't happen. You right. Know? And so uh, he um, really was the first coach that, um, you know, like I said, was able to stoke that fire and, and uh, kind of got me to fall in love with doing it. Um, and then I think uh, just like maybe some positive experience, I had another coach in high school that <clears throat> for whatever reason didn't um, see eye to eye with me and, and it got me out the soccer team and that's, and that's the only reason I ended up playing football, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a negative experience that was... Um, but my dad was there with me to, uh, we went to, I remember we went to that coach's office to ask him what I needed to do better to, to be on the team the next year. And, and he told me to not bother coming back cause I wouldn't make the team. Wow. And my dad, I remember him just saying, Hey Tom, I think it's time to go. And we just got up and left. And, um, I just remember the way he handled that situation. So no matter if it was a positive or negative experience, I had kind of some amazing support and stability around me to navigate all of those situations. Um, you know, Coach Heath in high school, our head coach that uh, whenever I went out for the team my senior year, um, you know, he wasn't enjoyable to play for. And when my, my uh, season slash high school career was over, uh, he was the one helping me get in contact with coaches and being a resource for me to go out and, you know, he was very helpful 
and and you realized how much he cared for you. He was tough to play for, but it right. um, was a great learning experience there. Um, college, I've just had one of the greatest special coaches in NFL history. Came out of retirement my senior year to coach at SMU for, I, it's a godsend, really. Um, and that's where the foundation name What You Give Will Grow came from. I was going to say, I think there's a story behind that, where the name came yeah. from. This guy had a, sounds like a pretty profound impact on he your did. life. He did. I was 22 you know, not, years not old. Not just from a, you know, a career standpoint in terms of football, but in terms of uh, who you have grown into and who you've become. Yeah. He, there was, I was a tremendous influence there. I was there. 22 years old and, and looking for some guidance. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was looking and I've, Fell in love with the guy within 15 minutes of meeting him my senior year. And, uh, you know, we, he always said we have a year together um, to, you know, to learn and to, um, and he, he really never taught me how to punt a ball. I mean, it was more about how to live your life and, and what's important and what's, that, what's to be valued. And, um, and he just lived it. He was a great role model. Anybody that ever played for him, it's kind of like a fraternity, like mm -hmm. when you know somebody that knew him or played for him or coached with him, uh, it's all a sense of pride that we, we all have that connection. Right. He, he meant a lot to a lot of people. And so um, I've had him, my kicking coach since my senior year of high school is the premier kicking coach in the, in the United States now, uh, Jamie Cole, and he's godfather to my oldest son, Maxwell. And, um, you know, I just have had a lot of wonderful um, uh, people that are doing things at the highest level mm -hmm. all around me um, throughout my journey and have all been blessings in different ways. So, you know, I think this is really good. And this is why I'm so excited about doing this interview. Uh, and, and I'm not, you know, I mean, we're still, we're still learning. You know, I mean, we got to have dinner last night and get to spend some time talking, but we're still, you know, I'm still learning more about Thomas Morstead. And I hope that people are watching this do as well. But it speaks so well to the heart of this message, this identity that we're trying to share through this brand surgeon. You know, there are people, this coach that you talked about, that he didn't really coach you as much as he taught you how to live life. And if I understood that correctly, and that had a profound impact that moved beyond the field, it affected you certainly in your ability to play football, but in terms of the bigger picture of life, one of the most influential people yeah. that came along. So, you know, that kind of brings us up to, I don't know, I guess we're going through the process here. You know, so you're playing at SMU, but how do we get to the New Orleans Saints at this point? Well, my junior year was my best year. Of my, um, my junior year of college was my best year uh, playing. And, and um, you know, I was kind of oblivious. I didn't know if anybody knew who I was in the NFL world or if everybody knew. And um, so, uh, you know. You know, Frank Gans would always just tell me, you know, he would just tell me to, um, you know, you can't be worried about what you're trying to get. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be, well, what does it take to get there? And you need to be focused on those things, all the process uh, of, of just getting better. And so uh, it was hard my senior year. We worked on a lot of things together that were uh, sometimes when you learn something new or you're trying something different, you take a step back before you spring forward. And so that was hard to do my senior year when I felt like everyone was evaluating me. And so my senior year statistically was not great. And that was really difficult. But he kind of, um, you know, he'd been there and done that. And so he, he, he had skins on the wall to kind of for me to mm -hmm. trust him uh, in the process of doing that. And, um, you yeah, know, it was just amazing. Um, it was an amazing year, to, especially going 1-11. It, right. it was really a special year to, to feel like you were enjoying the year when it was so uh, tough for the team. Um, and so uh, I actually got drafted um, on April 26th of 2009, mm -hmm. and then he passed away the day after that, um, which was just, you know, wildly bizarre. Um, that he would always say we have a year together and it was just kind of a you know it was a, it was it's just a bizarre how it happened right. um and so um i got drafted by the saints and um you know i could never have imagined 
still being playing, still playing here. I mean, right. It's been a decade now, and I've had lots of success. Uh, won a Super Bowl and been to the Pro Bowl, and um, have been you know kind of at the top of the league every year, and and the and the metrics that I'm measured by. And so, um, you know, it's been an awesome experience, and um, you know. Even my journey here in the NFL, once I got here, was, you know, I was drafted to punt, and then I started kicking off because our kicker, my rookie year, got suspended, and we brought an older kicker in who could kick field goals, but he couldn't kick very far, and right. I sensed an opportunity there, and I started to do that in practice, and I started off my first kick of my NFL career was a kickoff, and I've never done that in the NFL, or I'd never done that in college. Right. And so my first play of NFL was something I wasn't, brought there to do but there was an opportunity to go in and provide value and then right. when that other kicker came back um i kept that job because um, i was doing really well at it so um you know it's been an awesome experience for sure well you know you're an incredibly talented person but it sounds like you know it's had its ups and downs as you go through the journey you know and thinking back you played soccer which i know that's a bigger thing and Houston area. Ironically, yeah. you know, Thomas, you, know, you grew up just around the corner, even though it's a decade removed. My wife was right in the neighborhood, so yeah. to speak. But, you know, I'm thinking about that time and that transition growing up and, and becoming who you have become. It's taken a lot of turns. It wasn't necessarily a, a linear path. You know, and I, I think of my own life, frustrations or goals or directions. But, you know, the common thing that I keep hearing you say that you've always done your best at it. You know, you always looked at that challenge. Um, and applied yourself and through that a lot of these things came as a result but Bill Belichick called you one of the greatest kickers the league has ever seen or as great a kicker as the league has ever seen you know some of that there's a natural ability but some of it's a function of choice and dedication that you apply yourself but what I want to start to move into now is talking about some of the things that have come as a result of that you know as we we met and spent a little time around each other Again, not being a, a huge football follower, grew up in a town didn't have football. I mean, a state that really didn't even have football in Oklahoma. You know, I was more of a round baller follower. But, you know, I made the comment, I'm impressed more by what you've done than what you can do. You know, it's this expression that you have done off of the field that is so appealing, that so really matches surgeon. Because I think, I know for me personally, a long time, what I struggled with was, you know, what's my impact, what I'm doing? You know, my occupation's different than yours. And we always want to kind of look at other people's life and say, well, they can do more here, they can do more there, you know, they're gifted in this area. But this identity of, of surgeon, this message, is really more about just making a difference in people's lives, which I truly believe and I'm convinced we all have the opportunity to do daily. We're going to interact with people. We're going to have to, an opportunity, just like people in your past have made an impression on you. They've made an impact on you. We're going to change people's lives. It's just a question of really how are we going to change them. We're going to change them for the better. We're going to change them for the worse. And so let's talk a little bit about your foundation now. You know, you were telling me a little bit last night about how that came to be. And I, I want the people that watch this thing to find out more about it because it's a tremendous cause. And, you know, we can't see today the difference that we're going to make in the world tomorrow. It may not be our direct impact. It may be an, an indirect one on somebody else's life. So if you could maybe tell people that watch this thing, what's it about? What does it do? What's kind of its mission, its purpose and focus? And how did you get into that? Well, uh, the, the name is What You Give Will Grow. And that was from uh, a saying that our coach used to say repeatedly, what you give will grow and what you keep you lose. And uh, the more you think about those words, it can mean a lot to it can it can apply to a lot of situations and um, and so I just always knew I wanted to honor him and uh, what he meant to me and it kind of was the perfect name for it um, our foundation does a little bit of everything we focus on pediatric uh, you know ki kids things that are uh, we, we focus primarily with uh, oncology and uh, we try to provide experiences uh, for kids because there's a lot of emotional trauma that goes on when you're, especially if you're dealing with some chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, kids are faced with dealing with things that they really shouldn't be faced with, and um, and so it's just kind of it's called child life in the hospital, and mm -hmm. it's basically 
the social, uh, emotional aspect of um, kids being kids, Patch Adams effect, if you will. And uh, um, anyways, that's one of many things that we do. Um, uh, you know, we, we put on a prom every year on Good Friday of Easter weekend. Um, Very cool. For, um, I think this past year was between 150 and 200 kids that are going through cancer, blood disorders, different things like that. And uh, it's a chance to, you know, get them dolled up, get them in a nice suit, get them in a nice dress, uh, have a fun night out. Um, we throw a parents' party next to it, right? Um, but but not joined, right? Because uh, it's not cool to go to a dance with your parents. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it's what's really cool about it is the kids all connect with each other, and they can make they can make real relationships with kids that are going through similar things that they are, because no one really knows what they're they're going through except for themselves. Right. And then the parents' party is a whole other thing that's so special because the parents then connect with each other. And they are all becoming resources for each other in the, in the process that they're in. Some are just at the end of a cancer treatment. Some are just starting. Some have beat it. Some have beat it and it came back. Mm -hmm. and they're back in it again. And so they all have these life experiences. You know, there's no manual on what to do when your kid gets cancer. Right? right. It's There's good doctors. There's bad doctors. There's experienced. There's inexperienced. Uh, there's people that come from different schooling and different thoughts. And so... When you've got people that have experiences, uh, they can all share with each other, and they've kind of created their own community, which is right. really special. Um, and so that's just one of the things we do. Um, we are we very much pride ourselves on being reactive. Um, so most foundations uh, set a budget and try to raise the money to do those things. We um, try to raise as much money as we can, and then we see what needs there are and we go try to attack them and also um we are uh, like i said we like to be reactive you know we don't want to we don't just have things that we're doing all the time right sometimes there's nothing for a few months and right. then something happens and we can make a decision as a as an organization to make an impact in that need that has arised and so that's kind of that is really a special thing for us that uh, i say us are our organization to be able to be reactive and meet tangible needs of certain groups of people um, when they arise um, instead of just doing things to do things. Yeah, re really cool story about this too. You know, that first time that we ever met was through, you know, a request to donate something for a fundraiser uh, up in Monroe, close yeah. to the community that I live in, and where we donated a bag. And, then, and I was actually going in, I was at a dentist appointment. And people were like, oh, you got anything? I said, hey, is my lip going to be numb? Because, you know, you don't want to be at the party with, you know, stuff drooling out of your mouth because they overdid the, the Novocaine or whatever it was. And I said, yeah, I'm going to this event with Thomas Morstead. And it was it was really cool. I don't know if you remember this, and I probably get the details a little bit fuzzy, but it, basically a person at this uh, dental clinic had somebody that had been affected by your foundation. They had a child that had gone through you know, cancer treatment or gone through something. I don't exactly remember the details of it, but you know, that what you give will grow. Sometimes we don't see the growth that goes beyond us, but it was just such a um, very tangible way to see the impact you're having that you may not ever even see yourself as I'm getting a story completely removed. I haven't even met you yet of how you've impacted other people's lives through this foundation. So it, what's the reason or why that you chose the focus you did with your foundation? If you can maybe tell our people, because there's always a reason why. As I've gotten to know you, yeah. there's a lot of, everything comes back to the why, and yeah. I'm kind of that why, why, why personality myself. So I'm curious, is why focus on that? Why the focus yeah. on child life development, if you so, can kind of tell people? Yeah, so I had a friend named James Reagan, who um, I guess I can go back and start how I met him. He was not like a childhood friend. Um, uh, a friend of a friend of a friend, just somebody asked me after we won the Super Bowl, I said, hey, there's this kid that's doing a fundraiser. It's a, it's a um, cancer fundraiser in New Orleans, and I just would love it if you could show up with your Super Bowl ring for 30 minutes. Just just because. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I just showed up, and uh, I, my, uh, I guess, was not my wife at the time, girlfriend. I said, hey, I'll, i got to go do this thing. Um, and I'll be back in an hour. And I don't think I got back f like five hours later or something. Right. And uh, I just met James and he was, um, you know, he, 
he gave this impassioned speech at this fundraiser about what they were doing with the money that was raised and why that it was so important. And uh, he was in the middle of chemo at the time. And uh, anybody who's been through chemo, you know, it just kind of zonks everything out of you. And you right. wouldn't have known it other than he had no hair on his head and he's a young kid. Mm -hmm. and at the time, I think he may have been 17 years old. And, um, and so I just watched this guy inspire me. And then I, then I had to go up on stage with the MC and run the, the, the auction. And he went in the back corner and he was just gassed. He had nothing left. He was so tired. And it was just so inspiring. And so after the event, James came over and we talked a little more and got to know each other. And I gave him my number, just stay in touch. And, right. and he did. And, um, and so we just kind of stayed in touch and continued to, uh, I continued to go, you know, support events and ended up going to Corpus Christi, Texas, which is where his big family event is every mm -hmm. year out there. And he just became a really close friend. And, um, and he would always talk about how underserved child life was in the hospitals and how, how it was the biggest bang for your buck for kids. Um, and so I just kind of never forgot that. And uh, it was an another way to carry forward um, kind of the legacy of s what somebody uh, stood for. And um, I don't know, J James just was so uh, pure in his intentions of mm -hmm. why he was doing what he was doing. Uh, even when he was dying, he was focused on other kids in the hospital and helping them wow. in their journey. Uh, and it's not like he's a 40, 50, 60 year old person with life experience. He was well, I would say still, he, he was still a young, young kid. He was a young person with some tremendous life experience going through what he did. Absolutely. And, um, and he just, you know, he's one of those people that provides immense perspective on when people complain about the way things are in their life or why this isn't good enough or that, you know, you can look at him and say, how can I complain? You know, what wow. his attitude every day, if there's anybody that should be complaining, it's right. him. And, you know, he just was, he, he, his watching him be was inspiring. And so I just, um, after becoming friends with him and, and doing more and more things with him and his family to raise awareness uh, at these fundraisers was just kind of, um, I don't know, it wasn't like we even, it wasn't, uh, I wasn't searching for what to do. I knew that's what we wanted to do. Yeah, this is really incredible. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't sit down and script, which there's no script um, to this. We're just kind of yeah. sitting in your living room talking. But this identity that we're talking about, this message that we're speaking of, how it's really a function of a choice of, of making a difference in people. You know, we certainly, if, if people tune into this, they're probably tuning in because Thomas Morstead, not necessarily Chad Geis, but, you know, you're, you're in this public eye as a kicker for the Saints, an extremely gifted athlete that's, that's worked hard for that. But yet we go to this other bookend as we talk about people and the ability to impact people's lives. It, it, we're talking about a young man that was dying, essentially. And yet through his actions and through his um, perseverance through trials, impacted your life to where now you're in turn impacting other people. And yeah, that's, that's such a true expression of what this identity is about, is, is we can all choose to make a difference in somebody else's life. Now, you said they made a movie about him. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is? It sounds, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, he passed away at 20 years old. The, the movie's called Until 20. And um, it's just a really real look into kind of the last year of his life. And... Um, you know, it's, it's very, you know, there's, they don't leave much out. Um, and it's just a really, um, it's just a real look into uh, the types of things that the family was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, I can't describe it to you. You just have to go. You got to go watch you it. You got to go watch it. It's, it's a, a life-giving perspective. Um, so it's pretty special. Incredible. Uh, yeah, talk about your wife, Lauren. I had the opportunity to meet Lauren, and it's just a wonderful, <laughs> beautiful young lady um, that I'm sure supports you. Is is she involved much in the foundation? Y'all talk much about it, or you know, kind of what's 
What's that? Because, you know, yeah. the greatest people behind us, uh, anybody that knows me knows the only good part about me is the person that's behind me, and that's my right. wife. So, you know, I mean, uh, the support role that she plays. You know, she's, yeah, I, she's a little more reserved personality, yeah. as I spoke with her a year or so ago. But, again, a wonderful lady. Can you maybe tell the role that she plays in all this craziness well, that, that you're involved I in? I would say um, as of the past five years, it's been strenuous to – there haven't been too many other roles – because we've had four kids in five years, so we're congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> four times over. Yeah. So we've been uh, we're in the grind there with uh, you know on your hands and knees, changing diapers, and just um, you know you know how that goes. Yeah. And so um, and so I do know that as um, you know, it's like anybody, you do what you can, and so um, she tries to be there for everything that we do, and she is. Um, you know, she's the she's the glue of the family. You know, keeps everything uh, together. And um, you know, I I do know she's not. She would like to be doing more mm -hmm. um, uh, relating to the foundation. Right. As as time goes, hopefully that'll continue to. You know, we'll be, she'll be able to be a little more involved in what we're doing and and even directing where we're trying to head. Right. But, you know, at, around this, you know, talking about different roles that people play in life, you know, I think it's important for us to kind of lay this out and explore it a little bit more because we, as a society, we as a world, kind of put people up on a spotlight and say, that's somehow better than me or that somehow makes a bigger difference. But, you know, going back to your wife, you know, the role she plays in taking care of your kids, that's not a concern that you have. Uh, in terms of, you know, as you're gone or you're being involved, these other things, you know, your kids are well cared for. Yeah. They're in a, a wonderful environment. You know, you, you've got a wonderful supporting wife. And so I think sometimes, I know for me, sometimes we forget about the importance of the roles that maybe not the most prominent, you know, maybe a little bit more behind the scenes. It's kind of, again, we go back to this young man that you talked about that made such a profound impact on you. You know, the world could just dismiss that but it puts you on a new course it puts you on a path now that you're you're making a tremendous difference in other people's lives uh, are there any stories or any any young people that beyond uh, this young man that you've seen you know come through uh, the foundation that have been affected that you know any special stories other than that maybe you can think of um i would say um yeah, I mean, there's there's loads of kids. We have game day heroes, which we kind of do special events throughout the year. Um, and and again, it's kind of this fraternity that's been created amongst all these kids and the families um, that they all kind of become like a network um, and can lean on each other um, in all the different uh, ways that they're going through things uh, together. Um, and just seeing, um, you know, kind of. You know, you've got some kids that are energetic, some kids that are shy, right. some kid. you know, everybody's got their own personalities, but to kind of, um, it's just, it's honestly, you get more out of it than you give, really, because these kids, they are uh, so resilient, and they're so, um, I guess resilience is the best word, but they're just so, um, they inspire you, because you almost, you almost find yourself asking the question, would I have the same attitude if I were in their shoes, you know, and that's, um, I think that's a, that's a hard question to ask yourself, Sure, you know, and so, um, but there's not, there's not, um, you know, one kid that I'd want to highlight over any, there's a, there's a ton of kids that sure. you just see them. Um, um, you know, we do have one kid that's, uh, he seems to have t taken a bit of a leadership role, um, in the hospital that he is in mm -hmm. as far as making sure that other kids are okay right you know or or being a resource for them but the kids you know 13 years old right um, and so just seeing kids kind of come out of their shell a little bit and realize that they can make that you know that little difference in their world that they're in and that day is uh pretty special yeah i mean it, it, you have so graciously agreed to sit down and talk with this kind of about the things that you do and the impact that you know you're having in the world even though that wasn't what was in your mind 20 years ago when you were you know like the little bobblehead football kid out there on the mm -hmm. field you know you see him running around and the yeah. helmet's bigger than the kid is so you know your life's had this crazy journey 
Um, you know, we've talked a little bit, Thomas. I mean, can you share some of your thoughts on how you see this surgeon? Because, you know, this is, you know, one, we want to we want to promote an identity. And, and through this, we want to encourage people, you know, to, to live a life that's beyond themselves, whether it's in sports, whether it's in their workplace, whether whatever it is they do, we want them to understand that there's value. And no matter what it is, you've been placed here on earth. You know, everybody's been created with a purpose and given a purpose. It's a function of you have a choice to live that out. You have a choice on how you go about your day. You have a choice in the impact you're going to make in the world. And so, I don't know, we've talked a little bit. We can edit this out. Yeah. Uh, but could you speak a little bit about, as far as what your impression of this identity is, as we've kind of spoke a little bit, and, you know, maybe how you see it fits in the world. Maybe if that's not too big and too on the spot for you. No. Um, you know, it's, I don't know. It's a... It's a um, I don't know how I'd answer that. I mean, I think it it's the more you describe to me what what kind of the foundational values were of being the surgeon, um, it just kind of fit with um it's kind of like there's certain ways of operating and ways of doing things that um uh I guess it may, it it felt like a the right fit mm -hmm. and it's kind of part of like you know, I think whether it's my social media or things I'm doing in the public or uh, on my football team or my family, I'm always looking to add value. Right. You know, I'm, I'm looking to be a value add. And, um, and so if this message just is so pure mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, it's like one of those things if... I know it's corny, but if it affects one person in a really positive way, then that's great. And so, um, honestly, it was just more meeting you and right. and kind of having a discernment that uh, what you were doing was authentic right. and and wanting to um, you know help put that out there because it's it's um, you know we need more of it, not less. Right. And uh, and I think. You know, I just think there's a lot of, once you described all of these foundational pieces about um, extending yourself beyond your occupation and um, um, kind of it not being about you, and, and a lot of them kind of seem synonymous with what you give will grow yep. with the name. And so um, it just... Um, it just felt like a, the right fit mm -hmm. and um, you know any way that I can you know provide a story or a um, you know relate something back to something that people are interested in which is mm -hmm. tends to be Saints uh, or, <laughs> or, or just, new, or just uh, new Orleans in general right um, and being able to relate that to um, how some of those values are woven into that mm -hmm. and why they're important is uh it's kind of it's cool you know i do feel kind of a personal responsibility to do that anyways right so well and that was such a great answer you know and that's what we're hoping to achieve with this you know as we kind of talk before breakfast you know i, I listen to a lot of self-help books you know there's lots of things out there and people are inspire leadership or inspire this or do that and you know it's it's a lot of how to's but to me, being kind of a simple guy, you know, I do a lot of different things. We've talked about kind of my other day job I've got, and people can see that it's, you know, it's out there on social media. I've got several different businesses I'm involved in. And a lot of days, you know, people walk up and go, hey, man, is your boss around? Like, pretty close, pretty close by, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I just kind of, I, I learned a long time ago to be happy and find purpose in whatever I did, do it to the best of my abilities, and it would, in fact, have a purpose to it then. And so, you know, kind of the shortcut for me with this identity of surgeon, it, it kind of came out of my own personal struggles of looking for this sense of self-worth in whatever task I was doing because, you know, it wasn't maybe as notable as kicking a football or being in a Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, it was a little more kind of brass tacks and down to earth and, no. you know, out in the woods kind of stuff. And that's where this identity was born out of. But for me, it's a shortcut for people. Because you know, it's hard for people a lot of times to wrap themselves around self-improvement or becoming this person or becoming that. And you listen to all these things and it all kind of starts to become this stirred up soup that's maybe hard to follow. But we can identify with what a surgeon is. You know, we, know it's, we know there's an inherent amount 
of time, effort, energy, dedication that goes into becoming that person. We also know that unless you do something with that, that impacts another person, you're not a surgeon. You're not, if you don't help other people through the things that you've developed, you're just a well-educated individual. And so this identity becomes something that people can wrap their hands around and grab hold of. It gives them some handles that says, you know, now I don't know about all those self-help books. I don't know about leadership. I don't know about all these other things, but I do know a surgeon's purpose is to make somebody's life better, to find somebody in need and through the gifts and talents I've been given, make a difference. That's the shortcut. That's the, that's the choice we can all make. That's the calling we have. And that's why you're such a great expression of this is because you know, the, the connection between on the field and off the field activities may seem like they're really far apart. But as we kind of weave back through this story of the people that have affected your life, that have set you on the path, they, they maybe weren't football coach or maybe they, they didn't coach you as much as they um, directed you in life. They put you on a path of looking beyond yourself, looking to others. So, you know, as we kind of close up here, Thomas, is there anything that, you know, maybe words of wisdom that you would want to share with people in, in terms of, you know, the way you live your life, the, the can perspective you have, what it's really all about? Because you're, you know, you're kind of a goal-minded person. You always face that challenge. But is there a, man, we talked about so much stuff last night. Uh, I was just so impressed with the depth that you have at your age. Uh, relative to a lot of people. I mean, it doesn't really matter what your age is, but there's a ton of depth to you. Any most profound things beyond the what you give will grow comment. It fits your foundation. Is there anything you want to share with our audience? Um, I don't know. I mean, just kind of getting the flow of this whole conversation. I think, um, you know, I think it's like um, there's a lot of things that people could struggle with in life or issues they could have, and some of them were in their control and some of them weren't. Um, but I think big thing is just acknowledging where you're at, mm -hmm. like just whatever that is, um, and not to someone else, but to yourself. Right. And, um, and, and, and also realizing that, realizing that, uh, on this earth there's like, there's no like finish line, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a finite place. Like you're not going to have made it or gotten there um it's like a process of just it, it never ends right so i think if you can um so much of today's world is so short-term oriented or uh seeing something now or getting something now or in the very short term and i think the more you can be um you know long-term oriented um mm -hmm. and process oriented that that there is no kind of mecca here that, you know, it's just a process to con of continual improvement. Um, um, if you can acknowledge that, then you have a chance to really excel. Right. Uh, I think sometimes look, people look up and they see this big mountain. Right. And I think one of the things that I've been fortunate with is that, uh, when, you know, when I'm climbing something, I, I very rarely look at where I'm trying to get. Every now and then you need to like assess if you're moving in the right direction. Right. I'm very much a uh, blinders on, uh, just take the next step. Don't worry about tomorrow. Right. Just put your foot in front of, and then put your next foot in front and just keep making that decision that you're going to take another step. Right. And so it, it makes it a lot less daunting in your mind. Um, and um and so i think i've been able to do that and um but i just think it's about knowing that there's not like you know you're not going to attain something and be happy like you're not going to get having if i could just get this i would be happy or if i would just get that i would be happy i don't think that half i don't think that's real um you know i think about winning the super bowl like it's not about the trophy Mm -hmm. Right. It's about the relationships. We all did something together. Right. That's that's and that and, that, and we we get to say that for the rest of our lives as a group of men. Right. That is special. It's not about the, the hardware. Right. And it's not right. about the bonus check we got for winning the game. It's about the it, it was you remember all the experiences, the processes, the relational stuff. And um, and so it's just I guess 
to me, it, I guess it just boils down to um, my kicking coach a long time ago. At the very first camp I went to 15 years ago this summer. Um, actually, maybe 15 years ago to the day, if I look at my thing. Um, but he, at the end of camp, gave a talk on goals and priorities. And if, and if, you know, if your priorities and goals don't match up, then you're not being honest with yourself, right? So if, if you really want to be a good student, you need to study, right? right. Um, don't, don't say you want to do this and then not, and then not put the work in to get there. And so it's just constantly reassessing, um, do those line up? Right. And then I think just keeping perspective, constantly keeping perspective. Um, you know, a lot of what people ingest or digest on in their lives is the best of someone's life. The, 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 the highest moment, the, the best photo they got when they took 100 or the best experience. And that becomes seen as normal. Right. And that's not normal. You know, people don't put their dirty laundry out. They put their their fanciest stuff on. Right. It's, it's about an image. And so that's why I think it's just important to um, be centered in something that is uh, not of that, you know. And, um, and um, you know, I guess I could go on and on. No, there's lots of different pieces. Look, there's the, I'm sure this will be kind of chopped up in a lot of pieces and share a lot of sound bites. And there's just some great nuggets of wisdom here that that we can pull out of this thing you know and again my whole my whole front my whole purpose drive intention of surgeon yeah yeah we've got some great products that we kind of talked about you know they're they're really supposed to be a, a reminder and a representation of this identity you know we we gave you some stuff um that hopefully you'll enjoy but that's not where your significance is found you know it's it's not this thing and we get hung up that on that in our world. You know, this thing, as you said, you know, winning the Super Bowl. You know, if that's if that thing was where your significance was found, you've done it. Now, now what? Now, what are you left with? You know, it's it's going into living beyond yourself. And what this brand, this identity, hopefully is it will do, will simply serve as an expression to people of one the way you see them, hopefully the way you see yourself, and hopefully will remind you. Of the responsibility you've got to live beyond yourself, whatever your gifts, whatever you have been, you know, put here to do that you won't waste it, because that's the greatest tragedy I see. You know, there's so many people that are so talented, um, and, and they may not recognize their talents. You know, and again, we're we're talking about you know high level NFL football player and stuff here, but you know, me personally, I watch the guy that runs a paintbrush. You know, that, that you come into a beautiful home where you come into a big office building. It's like, who's greater? The guy that works in the building or the guy that created the building for the person to work in? You know, this is kind of a perspective that I hope to bring to the forefront a lot of times is we need to stop and back up and appreciate each other for what we do. So, you know, there's an element of surgeon's message that is living beyond yourself, but also recognize the value in those people that are around you for their contribution in the world. If we do that, I truly believe there is, is a change that can begin to take place. You know, calling that we have to people to, you know, we're all relying on each other. You know, we talked about kids, and you've got, you know, a house full of little tricycle motors around here. It stays really crazy. You know, we talked about my daughter, Riley. You know, tremendous kid. And this isn't about me. This is, you know, this is a discussion to talk about you, but there's such weight at such a young age and such purity that comes through her. I'm just a remarkably blessed individual. And as I was telling you last night, you know, on her mirror in her bathroom, she's at a ballet clinic for, you know, six weeks this summer. She has do your best today, just tomorrow's never guaranteed. I think there's just, there's so much that, that that struck me. As, you know, people put off tomorrow, I'll make a difference tomorrow, I'll live for somebody else tomorrow, tomorrow, today's all about myself. But we miss that greatest opportunities. You know, we miss the impact of that young man that, you know, you, you said as he got up, he gave a presentation, he was just spent. But yet it had a profound impact on you. Watching you know, how much he poured himself into changing other people. There's no barriers to this. You know, I, I think that's the thing that I hope that people will take away from this. You're a notable figure, but 
you know, one of the people that we see or hear that's in a challenging circumstances, he made a, he made a huge impact on you. We all have that potential. We all have that opportunity. So I just, I want to close up by thanking you uh, for your time with this. You know, hopefully people watch this, uh, I guess, you know, through the lens of this message we're talking about, you know, my hope is that I conveyed this, but you know, it's, from your perspective, is there a barrier to becoming a surgeon? You know, this identity we're sharing, you know, no. that's no, but I mean, I think it's like anything, the, the best, um, the, the, the best uh, connections are made one on one. And mm -hmm. so sometimes people can think, you know, this person has access to many or has access to much resource or things like that. And uh, the best things are done one on one. And I think, you know, um, it's kind of like feeling like your vote may count. Well, if everybody made the decision to go do it, that's right. It could be, uh, it could be tremendous. I'm Thomas Morstead. I'm a punter and I'm a surgeon.